Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, well, welcome to our session. Uh, the uh, session kind of follows up on the keynote this morning, but if you weren't able to see the keynote, that's okay. It's designed so you can watch it later if you want. Um, and we're basically doing a deep dive into what the basic information that I was presenting this morning about how uh, emotion, cognition, and social, uh, social skills are actually deeply intertwined in the way that young people learn and in the way that their experiences in the world, including at school, um, grow their ability to think and over time grow them to be, to be really um, what we might consider educated, thoughtful, uh, engaged, purposeful citizens. Um, and so I'm, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to do this session today with my good friend and colleague, um, and, and deeply respected guru of high school education, Doug Connect. Um, and especially so because Doug and I um, have been working over the past uh, a year and a half or so on, um, on a really deep dive study of uh, teenagers and how they learn and especially how teachers teach um, with a special focus, although this is really uh, applies to, you know, all kinds of teenage environments, with a special focus on uh, middle and high school students, and especially with an eye to understanding students in urban and uh, low SES uh, families uh, and areas. Um, so uh, so we're, we're hoping to share with you some of what we've been learning. Um, the findings are really early yet. Maybe we'll come back next year and tell you more about what's going on in teachers' brains, but I can allude to some of the really cool things we're finding. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, uh, it's about the social and the emotional skills that teachers bring. I mean, of course they need to understand their content, but the ways in which young people engage with uh, their teacher, the way that teacher makes them feel uh, relationally, but also really importantly, whether kids really uh, sense in and of themselves that their teacher genuinely believes in them, wants to challenge them, and, and actually thinks that they are a, 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 an intelligent human being who's, who's worth really putting time into because that young person has the capacity to learn. Um, those kinds of feelings and the ways that teachers can promote those are absolutely central to what we're discovering about how teachers teach. Of course, Doug already knew this already because he's been involved in all kinds of uh, school reform efforts and interesting uh, um, uh, work with, with teens. Um, so I'm just gonna stop here. You probably know who I am um, uh, if you saw me this morning, but I'm gonna ask Doug to just introduce himself um, and to give a little sense of some of the work you've been involved in, Doug, so people kind of uh, you know, know where we're starting from. Thanks, Mary Helen. Um, hello, all. It's a pleasure to be here, and I um, feel uh, equally um, lucky to be uh, doing this work with you, Mary Helen. It was uh, it was a, just for everyone. Um, persistence can pay off sometimes. We we met probably four to five years ago, maybe even six years ago, and just sort of tried to figure out what we could work on together. And um, uh, had some fits and starts, and this this uh, last couple of years have been incredibly, um, you know, just really rewarding to try to piece together what, if if you all who've joined us here have had, you know, you have memories of what worked for you as students, or if you've been teachers, what works for you when you're in classrooms with kids. Um, there's so much that feels intuitive after a while, um, and what what I'm what I've seen in your work, Mary Helen, and what drew me to your work initially was. Uh, the beginning of what seemed like a scientific explanation um, and it's kind of an inside the cranium explanation for much of what has felt like um, the way that kids, uh, especially adolescents, react and respond to teachers when they're really engaging them meaningfully in learning. And they understand, again, even if it's more on the intuitive side, that the developmental pieces of what's going on with kids at that age is crucial to, um, you know, to, to having that meaning-making opportunity for them um, and connect themselves and their, the stories of themselves with the stories of the, the world around them. And uh, so just briefly say that I started as a teacher, um, high school teacher in particular, um, and, and really enjoyed that time as a classroom teacher and 
um, probably the hardest job, though I will say that the, you know, after doing work with more of an administrative level and working specifically at um, large scale efforts in New York City Department of Education for about 10 years, I moved to Bank Street College of Education and am now an interim dean of the children's programs, which means I'm essentially running a school and an early childhood program. And um, as, as challenging as teaching has been, I can't imagine um, doing it now in the middle of this, this current situation. And leading a school and standing it up during this pandemic has been um, incredibly hard. Uh, and um, I, I will say that I have tried to think carefully about the way that the social and emotional pieces are playing out for people day to day during these traumas. And especially the, the 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 young teens who are who are entering, you know, from their perspective, a world that is very confusing, and they're trying to find themselves. And I know you've done a lot of work, Mary Helen, too, with um, you know, with 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 teenagers in the last six to seven months, and and trying to piece together the the connections around trauma and um, you know, solid identity formation as kids are also trying to learn important concepts um, to prepare them for for post high school. So I'll pass it back to you. But again, pleasure to be here with you all. Yeah, that's great. Um, and as maybe some of you know, I, I just for two years and uh, I, I was a seventh grade teacher in, in South Boston. So so I just have a, the teeniest taste, just enough to get an off-field filled inspiration for what you all do. Um, so, so what we thought we would do today is kind of deep dive into, da -da, um, it's a little past Halloween, but I just couldn't resist. Um, you know, how it is that relationships and relevance and meaning making are, are constructed by teenagers, right? Because I, I think oftentimes um, the, the schooling we do for little kids, you know, preschool, uh, you know, there's a lot of great preschool out there. There's a lot that's, you know, really struggling. And, but we know a lot about what it looks like when preschoolers are thriving, right? We know quite a lot about uh, what it looks like when preschoolers are struggling. Um, and, and through elementary school, uh, we also, you know, have a lot of knowledge about how to teach reading, how to teach early math, how to engage kids with each other socially. Um, and, you know, it's still an ongoing process to try to really build that into the fabric of of every child's school and build that's the support to do that into every teacher's, uh, you know, uh, uh, workplace. Um, but I think that adolescents are so often neglected in our conversations about how the science really can um, inform the way we design uh, for their unique developmental needs. They're, they're kind of like these little scary glowing pumpkins. You're like, what is going on inside there? I mean, I've got teenagers at home. I know Doug does too, right? And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, wow, they're, they, at once, they seem sort of like they're kind of risk-taking is how some scientists describe it. But anybody who really works with teens, I think, I mean, like, that just doesn't do it. Like, risk-taking, that doesn't capture what's going on. Like, you know, risk taking, oh sure, just stand up in front of the class and show your work and, uh, you know, take a guess at what you think that problem is. Or sure, just go ask out that kid you really have a crush on that you, you know, and go sit with them at lunch table. Or, you know, just wear that outfit that you really like that isn't really in style. Like really, they don't take risks, okay? They don't take those kinds of risks. And yet they are so needing the opportunity to stand out, to stand up, to really build their sense of efficacy and self. That's what, that's what teenagerhood is all about. Um, and, and we so often have this really negative narrative about teenagers, like they're just sort of stuck in between in this awkward phase. Um, and, uh, and I just, I find teenagers just totally fascinating and wonderful. Um, they're so passionate. They're, they can be just so amazingly engaged and they're right at that cusp where they're trying to figure out what kind of person am I? Who do I really want to be, right? What do I stand for? Who are my friends? What's my taste in music? What's my hair going to look like? All that stuff. But I mean, like in a more fundamental way, what do I believe in and value? And what are the beliefs and values that I share with my family or my community or that I need, might need to push the envelope on a little bit and I need some parents around to keep me in, right? These kids are right at a phase where they're doing this really exciting growth. And I just think it would be amazing if our schools 
um, could do more to support that kind of exploration process in a safe way, in a deep way for our kids, in a way that really ties what they're learning to the ability to think well in, uh, in disciplinary domains, right? When you're interested in something, learn the engineering that would help you really fix it. When you're interested in, you know, uh, some problem in society, uh, learn about what's going on and, and learn skills for journalism so you can express yourself and interview people. And, right? Kids are at this place where they're on the cusp of being able to be adults, but not quite. They need a whole lot of us wrapping around to help them, but they've got a lot they're noticing and seeing that is really exciting to pull out. Um, and so, you know, uh, if you saw the article that Doug and I co-authored last spring about some of this work, we called it Building Meaning Builds Teens Brains, because I, literally in our studies, we're finding that the ways in which kids sort of deeply engage with the curiosities and the, the bigger systems level understandings, trying to figure out not just what's happening right here, right now, but why is it like that? And, and how else could it be in another kind of future? And how did it get like that? And not just what do you look like on the surface, but what does it mean about who you are, what you stand for and what I am and what I stand for? And how do my actions and my choices in sneakers uh, for that matter and the way I cut my hair send messages to the world about what I deeply am about inside me? Right, and, and that is a really fragile, but also a really, really important place for educators to start engaging with our, with our, with our teenagers. And it's all about relationships, right? Keeping them close to us. Uh, you know, there's this myth out there that teenagers don't like their parents and they don't like adults and they're all adversarial. That's not true. They love their peers, but they need the backstops of the adults around them to kind of notice and sort of be there for them and help them unpack and help them role play and try it on a little bit and interpret what they're seeing. Um, and yes, of course, they aren't little kids anymore. They do have a lot of ideas of their own and they're very deeply attached to their peers at this point. Um, and that's wonderful, right? And, and that's where they build relevance and that's where they that's where they make meaning. Um, and I'm just going to invite you at any point, Doug, just jump in because I'm going to show some stuff and then we can have a conversation. How about that? Yeah, I, I, I want to say one other thing that is probably more your territory, but uh, so you might want to expand on it. Um, sure. You know, the, the folks may know this already, but the emerging science around the growth of the brain and at this time yeah. for, for human beings, um, it's just fascinating to think about how you know, the explorations that we want to do when we're teenagers and the, so, the kind of social safety net that we still need to do that, to take those risks that you were saying, yeah. um, you know, is accompanied or it's kind of, you know, is perhaps driven by the massive explosion of the connections happening in the brain and the pruning that's happening at the same time and how that was hidden from that's scientists right. in a way because of our own um, inability to see it, uh, you know, and, and that the advances in technologies are giving us this perspective now. That's right. Thank you for bringing that up. That's that's exactly right. We, you know, uh, in the last really only several years, right over the last decade, but really over the last three, four years, even less, we've been discovering at an amazing pace uh, the very, uh, very profound amount of fundamental brain development that happens across adolescence. That, like Doug said, we had missed earlier because. Well, frankly, because teenagers' heads don't get a lot bigger, if, in fact, from when they were little, right? And in fact, they even get a little bit smaller, right? Their brains, that is, get a little bit smaller because the pruning that's happening is sort of um, solidifying or, or, or making more efficient all the various possibilities they have when they're littler, which become, you know, sort of too many choices, so to speak. It's kind of disorganized and a little bit inefficient in children. Um, and then it becomes more and more kind of regulated and, and reliable brain function as they work their way through adolescence. And um, so we didn't really know about that until we started to develop, and by we, I mean not me, okay? Um, we started to develop uh, very uh, new uh, kinds of neuroimaging technologies that can uh, basically capture the not just the overall picture what the brain looks like or even like I showed this morning where the blood is flowing more right during particular tasks but can go beyond that to actually map out 
the, the structures, the microscopic structures of those white fibers that I painted this morning in the painting, right? That Margaret Lazari had done sort of floating if you saw it. But the, the, the networks of the brain are rewiring themselves in amazing ways in accordance with experience. And that means the way kids are thinking and feeling and relating to other people across adolescence is what appears to be growing their brains. And our data even show that these growth patterns, we can predict them in advance based on the ways kids are inclined toward really engaging deeply with information and thinking about why and how things happen as they do. That curiosity, that struggle to really make a big uh, story out of stuff and understand it beyond just what, what I'm seeing right here, right now, and really get something more meaningful, more uh, you know, true about the world generally, those struggles to be curious in that way uh, is what really seems to be growing kids. Um, and I, I think, and I suspect I'm uh, kind of preaching to the choir here that our high school models are not really designed to optimally support that kind of exploration process, that kind of try it on, think it through, you know, struggle with difficult things, but without having to worry about what the outcome's gonna be. Are you gonna get it right or wrong? Are you gonna get an A? Are you gonna get into college or not? Be here, be now, and really think with your peers and with the, the tools you have and with the information we're sharing with you as your teachers about what, what do I want to do with this information? What does this all mean? Um, and so there's massive amounts of growth. And I also want to just highlight the sad side of that growth is, is the amazing vulnerability that our teenagers have uh, emotionally, mentally, uh, even in terms of their uh, mental health, that, that teenagerhood is the period in which uh, we see the emergence of the majority of mental illnesses, if they're going to happen. Uh, we see greatly um, higher levels of anxiety and depression than in any other age group. Um, and, uh, and so there's a real cost to not engaging our teens in deep thinking about stuff that matters and helping them to feel connected and really like they have agency, like they have a sense of purpose. When they don't, they're at much higher risk for, for mental health issues that can, that can dog them for years or even for the rest of their life. So uh, this is a really, really important um, sort of sobering uh, discussion to have around the responsibility that we have for really helping our teenagers stay healthy and grow themselves. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead. So we ended with this, or this was one of the um, kind of, you know, lessons that I pulled out of the talk this morning that emotions are automatic, right? Responses to situations. You don't have to stop and think heart rate, go up, blood pressure, you know, increase, stop digesting lunch. We don't really need to be, you know, working on you right now. I need to get out of the way of this tiger chasing me, right? Um, you know, the emotions and the package of thoughts and actions that follow them happen when you're engaged in living, right? But what we really need to support in education, both in our teachers, right? Because we're all humans too and in our kids is the process of learning how to experience the world, how to feel those emotions in a way that help you make meaning, in a way that help you feel that satisfaction of deep understanding, that agency of being able to take what you've learned and use it for something in the world. Um, all of that kind of application of the knowledge that makes you feel powerful as a human because you understand things and can use what you understand to do things, um, that takes on a whole new meaning in adolescence. Why? Because unlike in littler kids, where it's some, they can do this a little bit sometimes, but in littler kids, you can see sort of what meaning they're making and how engaged they are with thinking about their academic learning and their friendships and things, by kind of watching how they act, right? A, a, a skilled teacher of third graders can look across the room and just settle on what Jose's doing or Maria's doing 
or Sally's doing and say like, oh, Sally's deeply engaged with what she's doing. She's working on her math. She's got her paper there. She's moving her pencil. Um, uh, but in teenagers, a lot of the work that is so fundamental to their deep engagement and meaning making isn't just about how you move your pencil on the paper anymore. It's not just about what answers you can shoot back when somebody gives you a problem. It's not just as if that were true with little kids too, which I don't want to suggest it is, right? But it's really becoming much more about how do kids develop dispositions for thinking curiously and systematically about uh, the world and, and in applying all of the academic and scholarly tools of discourse, mathematical tools for calculation and representation, artistic tools for expression and communication. How do they use these tools to make sense of the world, to share the sense they're making, to uh, learn from others ways of making sense and build cultural knowledge together that we call deep understanding of engineering and math or interest in biology and ecology and science or uh, uh, you know, a desire to be a journalist, right? Who uncovers the truth for people. Those kinds of dispositions are mental capacities that are sort of inferred. They're not directly seen by the way you move your pencil on the paper anymore like they are in kindergartners. And that makes it a really hard problem to actually know how and what our kids are thinking about when they're engaging with the, with the work that we give them in school. How do they learn how to feel about math, about English language, about uh, you know, any domain in which they're learning? How do they learn and take away bigger lessons that actually um, become part of who they are and part of how they understand how the world works and what's possible in the world as they go forward into adulthood? Um, Doug, if you want to jump in, just do so. Well, perhaps it's just a teeing up as where you're he headed soon. Um, you know, from a teaching perspective, I think, again, intuitively, you, you want kids to be excited uh, and yeah. feeling something really, especially if you're teaching something you're passionate about, um, right? So um, I think some of the challenges we face, and there's an interesting question in the chat we'll, we'll come to later, which is connected to this too, it's like, you know, if a kid doesn't seem to have the kind of necessary foundational skills, yeah. is there a perspective? And I'm not asking you to answer this. I'm just sort of teeing up the, yeah. you know, yeah. where I would assume many people's experiences have led them to ask, you know, like, is it how do you then engage with child, with with young people? Um, and any, you know, if they're if, when they're younger children, they haven't fully developed the kind of skills that you feel like they need to get into the engineering task that's super interesting and elegant right. right or you know and 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 so then there's questions of like the, the teacher toolkit around differentiating or you potentially see the direction that we may with some teachers which is that you go towards high entertainment value right. and but trying right. to build that that close relationship but then the content you know that is supposed to be meaningful sort of recedes or is very thin so yeah. just trying to tee up some of these things that we're thinking about in relation to what you're saying here that's excellent. And I just want to make clear, thank you for keeping an eye on the chat because I can't see it while I'm showing my slides. So yeah, I'm tracking it. We're good. That's terrific. And those sound like right on kinds of questions. So let's start um, by just kind of teeing up that question, as Doug said. And, and I think this is kind of this is kind of where we're heading is understanding what this is actually about. And what I think I would say is that and I'd love to know what you think about this too, Doug, right, is that adolescent engagement, right, for flexible, durable learning. Uh, the kind of deep thinking that actually results in memories and useful knowledge in identity development and in, in uh, you know, persistence um, in academic achievement also for the long term um, is, is really about in education shifting students from emotions that you might say are about outcomes, uh, about uh, did you get it right? Did you get an A? Are you gonna to get to go to college next year, right? You know, these things that matter, but that are not themselves about the feeling of knowing what it feels like, right? The, the learning to know what it feels like to understand something or to appreciate the power of some kind of idea, like a mathematical idea or a procedure or a, or a social idea or procedure or a scientific one or an artistic one, right? So we're shifting kids 
from emotions about outcomes, which are very, and we're going to show some videos from our study, actually, in a minute, that, that, that give examples of teachers doing these different things. And so we can sort of look at what this looks like. But, you know, getting kids engaged by, you know, getting them excited about what you're doing and like thinking about stuff that feels like they really care if they're going to, you know, get it right and they're going to pass the test next week and all that stuff, which is okay. It's way better than, you know, disengagement and not caring. But what we're going for here, what the brain development uh, suggests and the psychological development suggests is that what we're going for here is something deeper than that. It's, uh, it's, can actually be distracting to just be, you know, super excited about getting the right answer. At the expense, I think sometimes, of us really thinking about what kinds of learning experiences grow people's emotions about ideas. Actually give them the feeling of understanding something that is deeply important for or powerful for the way that we understand the world or could do something in the world. And that is a very subtle, hard idea. I mean, Doug and I have been like going around and around about this for, I don't even know, like at least a year, <laughs> trying to talk about like, what is it really that's the essence of excellent academic engagement in this age group? And I think that this is my best attempt to nail it at this point. What do you think, Doug? Yes, like uh, I'm just tracking the chat too. There's some interesting thoughts and questions. Um, for example, like when you, you were describing ideas and there was a question like what kind of ideas? I think you described a number, but you know, some folks may use essential questions or you know, mm -hmm. these sort of big unanswerable questions with, mm -hmm. with your adolescents to explore and get them interested, like where did life come from? Or, you know, you know, those are, you know, where did you come from? Um, yeah. uh, to, you know, to pretty typical things, maybe framing research papers like, you know, did X, Y, or Z really, you know, instigate the civil war? But to, you know, to try to get to what you're saying, Marianne, like how are they they're feeling about the ideas as opposed to, you know, whatever the next step is in towards getting out of high school or getting to the next grade <laughs> yeah. or getting the credit or, you know, so on and so forth, which, you know, I think generally we all know that the external accountability stuff is not the thing that's going to build kids excitement um, and connect the, connect them. Um, and so, you know, how do you create a strong intellectual kind of culture in your classrooms, which I, like many people have done work around and our work is trying to research what, when, when that's happening and what that looks like and what's going on with the teacher, what's going on with the kids, with how they're talking to each other, how they're making sense and what's actually going on in their bodies and brains. Right. Too. Their bodies and their brains. Exactly right. And, and it's this their ability to really have emotions about bigger ideas that actually allows us to predict their growth two years later and their, their happiness and their achievement as young adults, irrespective of IQ, SES, right? Ethnic group, which I think is really, really powerful statement about that this is really what grows kids. So just to be clear again, uh, what Doug said, like it's, it's not that the outcomes in the traditional sense don't matter, but it's that they can't be the focus of what kids are thinking about or why they're thinking hard. Because when they, those outcomes are the focus, then let's think about it this way. You have thoughts about the things that you have emotion about, right? And, and uh, so you can only really be, if you're having emotion about something, then you're thinking about it. If you're thinking about it, then you can maybe learn about it. But if you're not having emotion about it and you're not thinking about it, you really can't learn about it. That's how the brain works. We don't learn things that don't matter. We don't bother to store memories of and integrate information about stuff that we've had no emotion about, right? And if we did, um, you know, we, we run out of space <laughs> in our memories, right? That's not how we do it. We pick the stuff that's relevant and we learn that. So if what's relevant here is, did I pass the test, right? Then that's what you will remember. If what's yeah, relevant here is why are right triangles able to be flipped upside down to support building structures in an engineering design? Why is the weight distributed evenly? Then that's what you're going to remember. You're going to get the A along the way, but that knowledge will build you in a way that just teaching to the test won't. Okay, so let's look at a couple classroom videos. These, <laughs> I'm going to traumatize Doug here not to give anything away, but you know, so the way that this 
study went, some of the data that I'm going to show you right now are that, well, this one is from our own study. Others are from uh, other uh, teacher schools that have done uh, stuff that's uh, available around the country. Um, but we, we went to administrations of schools, high schools uh, that serve high proportions of, uh, you know, low socioeconomic status kids uh, uh, of color. Uh, and um, that were doing pretty well. High schools that were really focusing on social and emotional learning by their own definition, really trying to do right by kids. Um, we really didn't have any interest in going into schools that were struggling or going into teachers' rooms where teachers were really uh, struggling uh, and just documenting that. What we wanted to do was uh, we, we went to the administrators of these uh, schools and we asked them, who are your superstar teachers? Who are your teachers that the kids really gravitate for that you think are really doing a great job, um, who are helping the kids learn and who are really like the, 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 um, the, the mentor teachers or the leaders in your school? We would like you to introduce us to them because we'd like to know what are they doing, right? We want to study what they're doing. And so that's the premise of this study. So everything you're going to see actually comes from teachers who are identified to us by the administrators as being uh, you know, really, uh, really working hard on behalf of the kids, as you'll see. This is not trying to play gotcha with hardworking teachers, right? And that said, um, we're trying to learn from them about what's effective and, and what adolescent learning at its best can actually look like. So I'm going to play you a little clip from our data um, where we're videotaping a classroom and the kids' identities are protected because right, they're looking the other way. Um, and uh, it's just a video clip of a lesson that this teacher invited us to. He said, this is a lesson I'd love for you to see. I, I've really worked hard on it. I think it's going to be a great opportunity for you to see my best work with kids. Um, and it's, uh, so we went on the day he asked us. And, uh, you know, he's all wired up with psychophysiology equipment and stuff. And that's another, that's another set of data we can talk about later um, to see how teachers manage. Uh, but, uh, but I just want you to look now at what happens pedagogically in this lesson clip. And we transcribed it so you can sort of see. On the board in front of the kids, it says, how to play. You get this, you get this many points in this review game. They're reviewing for an end of term uh, test in a history class, history civics class. All right. Oh yeah, this game is Y2K compliant. A little joke for the adults in the room. <laughs> Question number one. Where did the decentralized structure of the two major parties originate? A with the 14th Amendment. B popular opinion demanded decentralization. C the federalization of the government. D all of the above. Choose the best answer. <laughs> Oh my goodness, there's a winter playlist today to go along with the Starship 2000 Holiday Edition review game. Are there game. holiday questions? Yeah. What? There will be. There's wild. Wow. This way. You got 15 seconds. Dumpers, you can't do that. Dumpster group, Alex. Uh, you're doing it, you're already up. That was the first one, so I'll give you a little grace there. You too, Brianna. Gotta have it up. Oh, no, it's great. I know, I know. But next, for next time, right? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, bless you. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. All right, everybody's got it? Thank you. And Holiday Edition starts to be down and says the correct answer. Wait for it. Oh, Our emanation. <laughs> <I'd say. laughs> Yay! 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 Okay, so a basic question for you to think about. And then, you know, how about if we split up into two minute uh, 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 breakout groups and talk with some of your colleagues about what you saw there. And the key question, are those kids engaged uh, in what they're learning? And what does that mean? What kind of engagement are they showing in their learning? And what 
will, what kind of memory building do you think is likely to result from uh, the kind of engagement that they're showing? So let's keep moving forward. And I'm gonna show you two other uh, classroom teachers um, who are doing lessons uh, in academic subjects for adolescents. And I just want you to get a sense of the same question there. Um, are the kids engaged? Uh, and in what way are they engaged? And what kind of thinking are they doing? And how do you think that's gonna impact the things that they remember from the lesson and what they learn? <laughs> Okay, here we go. The goal for today is being able to explain compound interest because that goes back to them meeting their financial goals. The so students we'll did a lot of work on calculating retirement, mortgage, and um, college education costs. I had a financial planner come in to talk about financial planning so that they can understand how to become a financial planner for the families that they were helping. For days they wrestled with their assigned families' financial situation and had to email back and forth to get more information and clarification. So on one side, they're looking at these very complex mathematical principles of exponential, and they have to switch that and make it conversational in a plan that a lay person can understand and not get caught up in the calculation. Cost of your home is 140000 to the principal interest, and that's going to be the payment for to pay it off in 25 years. All right, so there's one, right? Those kids are learning Algebra 2, um, but I want you to ask yourselves for a second, like, how are they thinking about the math, right? What is the role of relationships in their learning, of relevance of their learning, of deep meaning making in their learning? How is that math lesson teaching them math and how is it growing them as scholarly thinkers? And I'm gonna show you one more this time from a journalism class, right? So we'll get a humanities, we'll get a math, okay. The goal for today is be so my goal today is to really get them to think about how they might go about coming up with an idea for a commentary. Some brainstorming about what stories we all carry with us that are worth telling. And you'll see on the board over here, um, we are going to be talking about three phrases that you are all going to answer based on your personal experience. People will often say to me, I don't have a story. That's not true. Everybody has a story. There's some really interesting things written up here. Let me read them out loud. I care about loyalty. I care about love. I care about making good art. I care about reforming the foster care system. Yeah, Heaven? I like that one because I was in the foster care system. Tell us about why'd you write that? I wrote it because I was like, I was actually born and raised in foster care, and school would be one that I want to change. I think it's a great tool for social engagement, for civic engagement, because we often have a perspective we want to share and we want other people to empathize with us. Okay, so that's a lesson where the kids then go on to, uh, to write about the topic that they've, that they've settled into uh, and agreed that they really deeply care about. Um, and again, I just ask you to think about what are those kids engaged with there, right? What is their engagement actually fundamentally about and how is that growing them as scholars? How is it? contributing to their academic achievement and persistence? And how is it growing them as people? And how's it growing their brains, it turns out. So I'm gonna... Uh, so my goal today... Uh, move ahead and kind of, I just put this on a blank white page, right? The big, big like <laughs> question that hits us on the head as teachers of adolescents and, and as school uh, administrators and people who work with teenagers is what does it mean? What does it mean? What would it look like for adolescents to be deeply engaged in learning? And how can teaching promote that kind of engagement? Um, and so uh, are there things you want to add there, Doug? Are there any questions we want to take just a few minutes to kind of have a discussion maybe that you can monitor about people's questions and then let's sure. move in. Um, to just so you know what's coming next, uh, we've got the 
the teaching that came out yep. this morning, and then we're going to go into why. What do we think is happening differently in kids' bodies and in kids' brains and minds and in their civic growth and personal growth and social growth in, uh, in adolescent teaching in these two styles? Sure. I, I do want to acknowledge a couple of things, and, and the, a lot of this was named in the chat. Um, there were strengths in all three of those clips in Absolutely. terms of how the, the, right. the teachers, and, teachers. And, the, right. and the children, and we can, it, it's evident why the principals or the administrators suggested we went into those classrooms. Yes. I think the thing that, just so you all know, I mean, it's, it, we, are, we, Mary Helen and I are going into these classrooms actually wondering how the relationships are playing out. There's questions here about like, you know, you obviously can't know all the context just by seeing a quick clip, but like how did these teachers build these relationships or, um, you know, have this kind of culture in their classrooms where kids are, are engaging. And there are also a number of comments in here about the different types of engagement. Um, so in the first clip, there's no doubt that that teacher was working really hard and oh uh, engaging kids in a certain activity. And uh, there's no doubt that you know, the engagement that kids are, are, are evincing in all of those scenarios are different. Um, and that that difference will also play out because of the people who they are and the relationships that they have, which is, you know, a, a, a foundational piece of, of how you've built your research, Mary Helen, which is that we don't learn things without the relation. The relationships are fuel for us. And um, that is one of the things that helps kind of like, you know, uh, manage the, the dynamic between the, the, the teachers and the kids and the kids and the kids. Um, so yes, there are definitely positive things about all of those classrooms. Absolutely. And what we want to reiterate, because we're also going into classrooms asking this question, what are the ideas that are being put on the table? Like what are, what's the intellectual work that students are engaging in? And, um, you know, how much of that work is really the work that kids are doing uh, or how much of that work are they kind of rejecting or are they trying to figure out how to get around? <laughs> um, and you would see those things more clearly as someone noted here, like you'd have to see more of these clips to really get Oh, for get sure. This is just a little, yeah. yeah. It was so hard to pick these clips, by the way, just. <laughs> but, but ultimately it led us to a place of asking what the question of engage, what, what does engagement really mean? What does it look like? And what's the kind of teaching that kind of drives the engagement that we think is from your research, right? The longitudinal research you'll talk a little bit more about, um, uh, really the most impactful. The last thing I just wanna say, because I think this might be a moment for this, is there's a question about metacognition in the chat earlier and how that connects to, to emotions or how this connects to the, the pieces you were presenting earlier uh, or what's happening in the brain around metacognition. Okay, that's a great question. So about metacognition, and we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit more when we see um, start to break apart what do we think is happening in the brains and the bodily reactions of kids in those two kinds of engaged classrooms. And, and let me just really reiterate, all those teachers are doing a great job of keeping those kids on task and learning some stuff and engaged, right? Uh, I, I have no interest in standing up here and making somebody look bad, right? That's not the point. Um, you know, we picked things that teachers were proud to show us and, and with good reason. Um, uh, but metacognition. So, so what I would say here is that, and again, with adolescents, it's harder than it is with little kids to understand this, which is part of why adolescence, I think, has been so neglected in reform efforts around schools and stuff. Of course, there are pockets, and I'm probably talking to a bunch of those people right now, there are pockets of amazing stuff right, that's happening for adolescents. But in general, um, there's been less focus on what good adolescent uh, metacognition looks like than there has been in preschoolers, for example, or younger kids. Um, so in littler kids, what does metacognition looks like? It looks basically like being able to be aware of your own thought process and monitor yourself in real time. And we have been doing a bunch of work on that. Uh, those of you who are interested can go to Candle's website. We've got uh, papers up there that you can take. Um, where I've been working in particular with a really talented young scientist in Geneva, uh, Switzerland, named Solange de Nervaux, uh, where we did a bunch of work with uh, Montessori and traditionally schooled kids looking at the differences in their brain activity patterns as they engage in metacognitive processing in math problems? How do they notice when they've made an error? How do they fix that error? And how does that grow over time in two different kinds of school contexts, which in Switzerland is a big thing. They have a lot of Montessori education all the way through adolescence. 
Um, so that's, that's, you know, it's something you can sort of somewhat see, but that also is basically about being aware of your own thinking. In adolescence, metacognition, just like regular cognition, right, takes another layer. So you've still got all the stuff you've been doing up to that point. I need to monitor myself. I need to know what I'm thinking about. I need to keep on task. I need to notice if I'm doing well or I need to about face and fix something. You know, that kind of, uh, I've made a mistake. Wait, let me step back and strategize. That kind of metacognition is still there and absolutely essential, right? Um, and then on top of that, there's now a whole other layer that needs to develop. That is basically what you might call metacognition of abstract thinking. It's the ability to not just manage yourself in the moment, but I, while managing yourself in the moment, to also build time and space for deciding when it's time to dig in and move your pencil on the paper and get it done, and when it's time to step back and kind of think about what's the bigger idea here. What does this actually mean? How does it all come together? What am I understanding about the big picture of what I'm learning and doing and how it relates to who I am in the world? What kind of world is possible? That kind of high level steering your own thought process to notice when it's time to step back and be curious again and gather more information, start exploring the ways that you're thinking about things and that other people are thinking about things. But then also not just wallow there because that exploration process isn't getting any work done, right? So that you must go there, but then you also need to come back from that and decide, all right, so I'm gonna, let's do it this way. Let's, let's try it, let's build our bridge like this. Um, or let's solve the problem like that. Let, I'm going to organize my essay like this, and it's going to be about the foster care system, not about my grandma, right? So then you have to kind of get back out of it, know when you've been there long enough deliberating, and, and be able to marshal yourself to dig in in a kind of task-oriented, efficient way. And so metacognition is deeply involved with what we're talking about here, but just being aware of when you should and being able to move yourself isn't enough. You actually have to do it. And so the thing with adolescence is that it's the kids who have the opportunities and that who build the chops to kind of move themselves, but they need the freedom to do that. They need the freedom to say, it's time to dig in and work. And then they need to be able to step back and think about things and make bigger sense and decide what is my topic for my essay gonna be, right? And as they do that, we as educators need to provide a kind of safety net, a space for them to engage in the shifting back and forth, which there's, they're awkward at that, at that age, right? As adults, we're quite good at noticing, okay, just, you know, I'm grocery shopping. Mary Helen, get yourself down the aisle, like whatever. You got to get home by whatever time, pick up your kid from whatever, right? Like bread, yeah, cereal, this is what we need, this is what we need. But then you get to something and you think, well, wait a minute. Um, is this a healthy choice? Is this an environmental choice, right? You know, or is this on sale this week? Maybe I'll shift, right? And I'll buy grapes this week and not blueberries or whatever, right? You have to notice when it's time to kind of shift and step back from just go, 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 go. And you yourself have to build the sort of strengths to do that. Those capacities to do that is what is metacognition in adolescence. It's, it's not just stop yourself in the here and now or think about things or be aware of what you're doing now. It's about stop yourself and think about the big picture, the deeper meaning, the possible future, the historical context. Being able to move in and out of those spaces is really hard and they need a lot of practice. Just like three-year-olds need a lot of practice not eating the cookie, you know, they need to be able to hold themselves together and not freak out when they're a little tired or something like that or they don't get the swing set turn when they wanted it. Teenagers need a chance to hold it together and think about, well, why do I want to reform the foster care system? What does that actually mean to me? And not just freak out and not just back off, not just write an essay about anything, but tie those two things together. And, and so that's really what metacognition is about. It's hard. It's hard to do and it's hard to understand um, in adolescence, which is one of the reasons why I think it's uh, not been so much talked about. We talk about it a lot with three-year-olds and with seven and eight-year-olds, but we don't talk about it so much with our 16-year-olds. 
um, we, and when we do talk about it, we tend to talk about it as uh, reassessing risk, right? Which is important, don't get me wrong. You gotta think about, it. wait, what are these other kids thinking I should do? Like, oh, I don't wanna do that. I don't think that's a good idea. I'm gonna call my dad to come pick me up or whatever it is, right? Um, which is a kind of metacognition, absolutely, extremely important, but it's, it's not the only one. And that's the one we focus on a lot. So Mary Helen, as we shift, I just want to sort of um, name a few things that I think this group, just we're also reading the chat, you know, is, is in, in agreement with, if we can say that with 150 people who aren't talking to each other. Um, so, you know, understanding devel human development in this age and what's happening in their bodies and their brains and the social aspects, which is what we named early on, um, and identity development, wanting to take those risks, be, you know, create your own identity, but needing a social group to be safe enough to be learning and taking those risks and, and failing. Um, and then having those relationships with your adults uh, and your grownups. And um, this co connects a little bit to one of the questions about working with families um, yeah. as well, especially as kids get older, um, that, was, that was put in. Um, you know, thinking through about how kids have relationships and how they're strong enough for kids to be resilient through the, the struggles of teenage teenagedom. And then lastly, what do you do with those relationships, I think is where we're moving. You know, you can, if you can get kids to really engage with you and with content, which is where we're, then, then, then the question becomes like, and I'm seeing lots of ideas in here and resources that people are putting in around project-based learning, um, you know, kind of like um, backwards design and other types of, you know, content oriented design um, thinking in, in curriculum. So there's, and, and we're not here to posit there's one way to do curriculum. Yeah. I think, and I'm not suggesting you are, I'm just saying, naming for the group that thinking about those things as the foundation and then getting to the point where you have that real authentic relationship. And then what do you do with it in terms of the content and disciplinary um, pieces? And where are the kids' skills? There's a question about kids with more serious, um, either neuro neurodiversity issue, you know, in terms of range or like learning disability issues. And I think the last thing I'll just say is getting to know each child, and that includes their family as best you can and their culture, cultural background, and understand what motivates them and what they're interested in, and also their limitations, um, is going to be part of the foundation too. Um, and, and so I know I'm also just trying to set up the shift to the next slide here because we have. Uh, you're doing great. You're, okay. yeah, right. I can see the metacognition happening there, Doug. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. I'm working, Mary Helen. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh my God. You guys just keep thinking. I wish we could all be in a room together for like, you know, this time and really think out loud together. Um, so I'm going to take us back, you know, and, and, and this question of metacognition and also of how do you do this and, and absolutely plus one to that there is not one way to do this. And, and it's not like there's a right way and it's going to look different in different places at different times. And, you know, some of what teacher one did there can be fun when kids are excited anywhere or when they need some bucking up. But you know, some of what those other teachers were doing can really get them engaged with the ideas. I mean, I think, I think it's about us really thinking hard about how our kids are experiencing, how they themselves internally are experiencing and thinking school, right? Um, and so it's really about our perspective taking abilities. Um, so, uh, so high quality education, we talked about this this morning, and, but now we have a new kind of basis for thinking about what this means. Um, it accomplishes three goals, right? Three big goals. Uh, one is that it helps students learn to build the internal narratives, right? That reflect the content and the skills of school. So that, you know, like that one teacher said, everybody's got a story, but how do you build your story in a way that reflects what you're learning how to think like as a, as a, as a journalist in that case, right? And, and that starts to get at where the kids with the skills, right? Kids can build their story, and then when they've got that, that becomes the fodder for working on the skills. Because if you want people to actually read your, you know, your piece in the school newspaper, well, then I'll help you work on it. So it's got topic sentences, and it's got proper spelling, and it's got grammatical, uh, you know, grammatical structures that actually others will be able to know what you mean. Otherwise, they won't get what you mean, and you won't have, uh, you know, you won't have done what you set out to do. So working on the skills in the context of the narratives that kids bring, that's what I would say. And Doug, you know more about that than me. Um, 
uh, just, I'm going to just to say one. just to oh. say on that one, you got that means teachers and we all need to create space for kids to do that kind of work of talking about what how they're piecing things together. And if kids don't feel safe enough to do that out loud, there's journaling and other ways that kids can do that kind of expression. But we have to figure out a way to get them to start telling us how they're piecing this stuff together and where the holes are. And of course, those are done through formative assessments or more, you know, interim or even some summative type assessments around skills and things like this. But the key insight I've gotten from working with you, Mary Helen, is this narrative, this this like how pe how we all as human beings try to make coherent the different pieces of things. And, and that's funneled through our own perspective. And so that's, you know, that's also subjective. Um, there's no doubt Absolutely. about that. It's not, there's not like a standard we're gonna be applying for the rightness of a narrative, but there is a standard we can apply about the rightness to the use of the evidence uh, and the argument that they're making. Yeah, that's right. The, not the rightness of the evidence or the choice of the topic or the outcome that they decide on, but the complexity with which they build and argue for their perspective, that we can judge, right? And that we can support them in doing, no matter what it is that they come to want to argue for, right? Um, we can support them in doing that more systematically and in a more scholarly way. Um, and they'll build skills in the process. Um, but it, it does, Doug, it also really uh, speaks to the ways that some of our most cherished structures, and we're gonna get to this in the next set of slides, you know, our grading rubrics, our, our, um, our high stakes outcome tests, can uh, for many kids really um, uh, be so overwhelmingly emotionally salient. And then you've got emotions about outcomes, which just swamp the little growing emotions about ideas that are just, you know, those are growing ideas need to really be things that kids feel safe to indulge without worrying about, yeah, but what about the outcome? Like, let's be here now and think about these things. And then the outcomes are going to happen, right? And we can design for those to happen. That's what makes uh, really excellent schools really excellent. Um, and so this is that third piece, right? It's, it provides, good education provides the targeted situated support and the instruction for acquiring those building block skills, right? So, okay, you want to reform the foster care system? Okay, well, what is the key point you want people to understand when they read your essay? work on writing a sentence that encapsulates that, right? So now, rather than we're all gonna learn how to write sentences just because, which there's some of that is okay, so long as they do have a sense of, and then we're working toward this bigger project. But like, we do so much of the just because, I told you you're gonna need this in college, or I told you you're gonna need this to balance your checkbook, and when, when kids don't actually see the relevance, right? Um, and so we need to help give them the opportunities to, to acquire those building block skills so that they can access information, they can uh, judge the quality of the information they're getting, they can solve problems, they can communicate with each other uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and learn from each other. Those skills then get embedded into the process of building understanding and narratives as compared to uh, being an almost entirely standalone skills that are not seen by the kid, felt by the kid as relevant to what they really care about or to what they're thinking about on a daily basis in the world. Yeah, and the reason we put this third, I would say of all three of these, because it was a conscious decision is that if, if things are going really well with kids, they're gonna tell you what they need in a way to really reach the bigger goal um, that they're shooting for, that you're helping them. Right. On, the, on the way. Um, and then the other thing I just want to name, which was a really great aha for me and working with you, Mary Han, is that we build narratives anyway. Yeah, so, that's right. You know, They're there, the, right? the kids are going to have their own narrative, whether it's about the test they have to pass or it's actually the thing they care about uh, more inher you know, inherently after the hard work of like getting into what the foster care system is about, not just from your own experience, but you know, outside of your own experience too. That kid's thinking about the foster care system. He's living it every day. So are we gonna connect that to academic skills and use it as a place for him to learn to write sentences and you know advocate for himself? Or are we gonna make that not part of what he does, right? Um, so we can come back to these and they're in the article. Um, all right, so, so here is a little sort of deep dive, if you will. And this, you guys are the first ones we're kind of trying this out on, all right? Um, 
uh, but it's a deep dive into the ways that teenagers think when they're engaged. So I'm not, we didn't go and say like, when kids are disengaged, uh, you know, nothing's going well for them. We're, let's go with, when kids are really, they're on task, right? And they are paying attention, they're excited about it in some way, whatever that means. Um, what are the ways in which they can be either engaged deeply, I called it, like, and I know Doug doesn't love these names, I don't either, I can't think of really great ways to say it, maybe you guys can suggest some for me, but engaged in the kind of reflective meaning making that actually builds the story um, and the skills within it, uh, versus more shallow meaning making and more shallow engagement, which isn't a bad thing, but it's like, I'm doing it for the outcome, I'm doing it to get the grade, I'm doing it to just because I need to memorize these elements and put them on the periodic table so that I can go on to the rest of the chemistry. And you know, some of that's okay, some of that's okay, but when that's the sole reason you do school, uh, that's not a healthy uh, uh, habit. And we're gonna sort of talk about why. So, so here we have our hypothetical essentialized teenager um, on the left who is deeply engaged in school. So, um, you know, is thinking really uh, in, a, in a reflective narrative constructing way about what he's thinking. So he says when he gets it wrong, huh? What went wrong here? You know, what can I do differently? What do I need to do to figure this out, right? Or, oh, that's how this works. Oh, oh, I wonder about, you know, whatever the thing is. Um, and then here's him, um, you know, his mirror image self uh, in a more shallowly engaged situation, which he's still engaged, right? Oh no, I get it wrong. <laughs> how do I get the right answer? How, what if I can't? What do I need to know? That, why do I need to know this, right? How do I get an A? Um, yay, I got it right, I'm done, right? Um, and you know, how much of this do we see in our schools? And, and we, uh, it's way better than you know, no engagement at all, but let's see how that really plays out in terms of a young person's development. So here are the roles of the teachers kind of laid out and we've already talked about these. So in deep engagement, Teacher engages students really by kind of strategically inviting them into uh, to explore a complex problem or a big idea. Uh, teachers help the students navigate this problem using technical resources and support. Students explain, defend, revise their work. They use their academic skills and they make students uh, help students make their thinking visible and encourage ownership of their thinking. And you saw that especially in the two. Uh, uh, lighter clips, right? Where kids were given a big problem. You've got a family that needs financial planning help. How are you going to help them? Let's think it through, do your math, make a spreadsheet, email, present yourself properly, all that. Um, where shallow engagement, maybe teachers engage students by making the content entertaining, which we saw a beautiful example of that. That guy was working hard. He really cared that those kids didn't just drop off the map and not do their civics test the next week, right? Um, focusing the students on the outputs, get the right answer, B, hooray, you get points. Um, teachers provide activities and rubrics, right? That was entirely of the teacher's design. Hold students accountable for finishing, make sure they get all the way across the finish line and, and they judge the student's success, uh, uh, you know, uh, as compared to on the left where students are much more thinking through with the teacher about their, their work. Um, so here's where we think it starts to play out in the body. So for the deeply engaged, right, what we think we're finding when we measure uh, teachers and kids' physiological reactivity is that we see physiological signs of challenge, right, and increased attention when they make errors, okay? So if they are like, wait, huh? That can't be right. Uh, what, wait, what, what went wrong here, right? We see them getting aroused and digging in to try to figure it out. Um, Whereas uh, in the kid in the shallow engagement, when they get it wrong, what you see is physiological signs of stress. Dang, I only got a D plus and I needed a C to pass, like, right? Or I'm gonna get it wrong, I'm gonna fail, or uh, you know what I mean? That kind of like, oh man, I didn't get it, it was A not B, right? Emotions about outcomes are physiologically stressful. Um, and over here in deep engagement, what this generally does is encourages exploration and trial and error. Try it on, figure it out, engage in the process. And that's where we think they're developing the metacognition, right? For the person who asked that. Um, and self-directed executive functioning, that's what EF is, um, is strengthened. So they're learning to direct themselves through the learning space. 
Um, whereas uh, in a more shallow engagement context, it encourages avoiding mistakes and avoiding failure, right? You don't get it wrong, get it right, and then you're done, right? And following the rules, following the rubric, following the, the proper procedural step, and then you know you're done because you got it right. So you do need to know the procedures, but if your goal is to follow them as compared to understand them and sort of explore in them and try them out and understand why they work the way they do. We've got lots of video clips of kids from other experiments um, showing us their thinking in these two ways. And it's really quite uh, amazing. Kids who are in this exploration trial and error, they say things like, I'm gonna think more about this tonight. I don't think, that one third is half of two thirds, said this one kid. I don't, I don't see, I mean, I see you're showing me the three thirds and the two thirds and I'm, you're cutting it, but this isn't what I think of when I think of one third. I'm gonna come back tomorrow and tell you more about why you're wrong, right? Um, but the kid is thinking about one thirds when he leaves school. Whereas the kid who just, you know, gets it right or gets it wrong and isn't deeply thinking about it, isn't gonna learn as much math in the end. The learning process is intrinsically rewarding. It feels relevant to your real life. I'm writing about and I'm thinking about things I care about. I'm doing math that actually changes my life or other people's lives. Uh, I just, Mary Helen, can I jump in yeah. here and say that yeah. I think it's also important. You were talking about one thirds and two thirds or three, three halves or whatever it was. Yeah. That's one way to make sure that this is connected to real life is to actually have real life scenarios where we saw like the budgeting exercise of financial planning. Kids can actually be really super excited. I'm sure you all have experienced this just about the ideas or the concepts That's of right. math um, themselves. Right. It but, doesn't have to be like but, applied, right? Well, what, and what your what your research on the you know in in talking to lots of kids and what we're seeing in the classrooms is that that becomes part of who they think they are, and that's why it matters. Mm -hmm. You know that then it's real life too because it's about who I am mm -hmm. and how smart and powerful I am as a thinker. Right, uh, that's right. So if in the article that Doug and I provided for you at the very bottom in the footnotes, there is um, a link to some kids uh, doing their math um, exhibition in a New York City uh, school uh, that Doug's been affiliated with. And the kids are um, explaining their work and uh, you know, a sort of graduation days, so that kind of thing at the end of the class. Um, and you can really see this, like the kids you know, who typically would not think of math being part of their identity. They feel powerful when they do math, right? They, it just the idea of this Zeno's paradox and like then understanding fractions and the idea of infinity gets this kid all on fire, right? And, um, you know, that's a new way of thinking about relevance, right? It feels powerful when you understand things. And, and that wasn't taking Zeno's paradox and making it into some complicated you know, like real life thing, which by the way, can be a wonderful way to do math too. But sometimes we as educators can go down a route and be like, oh, it's all gotta be super relevant now to this kid's life or right outside my door or whatever, you know, whatever our, our local neighborhood or which, which again are important pieces of learning, but it's not always the same yeah. um, when it comes down to conceptual ideas. You can't always easily just translate Right. an idea that is also powerful into into a you know real life situation without watering it down perhaps yeah that's exactly right and you know that's one thing about teenagers right teenagers are in a space place developmentally where it can feel incredibly exciting to be thinking about ideas that are like big powerful like blow your mind ideas to them that really they don't you don't see any reason why you would want to think about that just in your daily day to day what you see around you and that is incredibly motivating to them neurologically. Like we think that there's a kind of a zap of arousal that happens when you think about things that transcend, right? Your everyday real world in teenagers. And, um, and so that's a, just an excellent point is that we don't need to tie it to something they're gonna use uh, in their day to day life, you know, just to manage themselves. But it's really empowering and exciting to go beyond that for teenagers a lot of times. Um, so uh, executive control, right? In the brain now we're talking, um, that executive control for deep engagement seems to be specialized, and we talk about this in the article, for kind of pivoting yourself. This was the person's question. Pivoting yourself between digging in on the work and sort of stepping back to think. Um, based on what seems to matter, the, you know, the perceived salience, what, what seems important here. 
that I need to bother thinking more about. Um, whereas in the shallow engagement, executive control is kind of specialized for working quickly, getting uh, discerning right and wrong answers, staying on task. Do you need that kind of executive control also? Absolutely. But what we're saying is only that doesn't lead to really good mental health and it doesn't lead to life skills for using um, your sort of scholarly dispositions to navigate your world uh, bigger than just this class right now. It's a piece, but it's not enough. And so what we see in our data also is that through adolescence, the, the deeply engaged, uh, the kid with a lot of opportunities to do deep engagement develops these propensities for kind of abstract and systems oriented thinking and for civic thinking. So thinking about the greater good, thinking about the bigger picture. Um, and uh, we see that in the article too, you can see that. Whereas in shallow engagement, uh, this isn't a bad thing, but they are inclined mainly toward kind of concrete and achievement oriented, do what you're supposed to do, follow the rules, uh, be compliant, uh, get your A's, uh, and civil thinking for good behavior. You need to, you need to be, a, you know, do what you're supposed to do, which I'm not at all advocating that it's, uh, that's a bad thing. It's good to do what you're supposed to do, but to also be able to think about in what is the bigger picture here of how this is actually shaping the world. That's what is just a fire under adolescence. And, and uh, intellectual identity both includes and transcends school in deep engagement, right? Um, you're an intellectual, no matter where you go, whether you're in math class or you're out um, with your grandma, you have this secret power of understanding and thinking about stuff. Um, and uh, uh, learning is process oriented, right? It's about over time, how do I come to understand things? Uh, and it's developmental. It's like a story you tell yourself. Um, and we didn't really go into this much today, but, uh, but it basically integrates what we would call semantic memory, which is facts, your ability to remember stuff. Procedural memory, which is basically your ability to do things, right? Solve the math equation, uh, know how to do your long division, right? Which you absolutely need semantic and procedural memory. But so often in education, we stop with those. If you can do it and you know the stuff you're supposed to know, we're done. As compared to thinking about how do we take what you know how to do and what you know and integrating those into what we call an episodic memory, a story-like kind of construction about why it works like that and how you experienced it and what it's powerful for doing and what else it could apply to. Um, so to think kind of about what an episodic memory is, uh, there's a really, like, a, like an example you could take would be um, for just for a thought process, right? Just imagine for a minute, um, uh, answer the question, how many uh, windows are in your house, right? Or how many windows are in your, your kitchen, right? The way most people answer that, they don't have the semantic knowledge, unless you just bought curtains, you don't know the answer, right? Uh, you don't, but you do have procedural knowledge. You know how to count, right? And you enact it, one, two, three. You know how to do that. One item, one number goes up, right? You'll learn that when you're three, four years old. And you're leveraging your episodic memory you didn't even know you had, which is I've spent so much time living in this house, I can imagine being there. I can move myself around the house and I can use that, that rich experience of what it feels like to be in my house because I've done it so much to, and, and then enact procedures that I know how to do to solve any kind of problem. I can answer a question I never learned the answer to. And, and that's what this deep engaged learning does for you. All right, so there's a number of questions, Mary Helen, that I think, and comments that I think we should pull in because we have about 10 minutes. Yeah, um, about 10 minutes, so we can uh, So let's try to also, let's see if we can be um, somewhat discreet in our, in our responses. Um, so there's a couple of comments, just so you know about the, the name shallow thinking. So I think it's good feedback for us to think a little bit more. It doesn't yeah, have such a negative connotation. Yeah, it's a better way to say it. <laughs> yeah, well, um, people, should give us, people should give us better, better words. Um, mm -hmm. but I think there's one thing I do want to raise, which are some questions that have come up about, you know, what might be inherent limitations for kids. So disabilities came up, but also social situations. 
and you know maybe it is the case that kids aren't able some in some ways or shape or form in their lives where they are to be able to do this more deeper type or maybe they have some toxic situation growing up where their brain has been reformed in a certain way physically because we've read about that um i'm actually extrapolating a little bit from a, a comment but I, I just want to say personally, I think that what we are seeing and that Mary Helen named earlier is that the, the work of narrative building and creating abstract systems thinking, as well as the concrete skill and relationship kind of management day to day, that can happen across skill level and it can happen across um, uh, IQ and it can happen across SES. And so we shouldn't be giving up on any kid. At any, no matter what their abilities are or where they're coming from in terms of telling their story. And that doesn't mean to get them to tell you about the hardships that they have. That's no. getting them to tell us about how they're making meaning of what's in front of them and what right. you're putting, you know, putting kind of as a curriculum, right, for them to experience. That's right. Their experience of engaging with the math is what you need to uncover. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's a, an interesting question that came earlier about... Um, Sort of like, you know, given we're all virtual right now, right? And that's the world we're in. And it is so weird, as someone noted, just to see kids sitting next to each other with no masks on. And <laughs> um, yeah, well, those, these, were, these videos were collected last year, so. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, what, what the question essentially is, what is the opportunity that we now have with virtual learning potentially in this research yeah. and our insights? And, and there is a comment about like, we may be missing our chance right now, um, you know, because right. there could be some real opportunities with this different format and opportunity you know that's not just about the construction of school right. as it has always been and i know you've given you've given some responses to this in previous places so yeah. just in terms of the brain and the learning and things like that i don't know if there's some things that you would want to say uh, for a couple of minutes about the virtual aspect of learning right now yeah for sure so i've got a couple things to share with you. you guys are all thinking this is hard stuff right this is we don't know the answer to this this work hasn't been done yet we're on the cutting edge so in terms of virtual, um, you know, we, what really matters for how people learn and how they grow their brains is how they're thinking and feeling. So it's super hard work, but we need to find ways to help kids think about stuff uh, in a way that feels safe, in a way that helps them understand, feel like they can do something about it, feel like their school skills are helping them to, to accomplish something despite all the difficulties. And I know that's easy to say and hard to do. Um, you know, that video, A Trusted Space, the PBS documentary that I put up this morning is a video that's all about uh, ways to do that and, and like teachers doing that across age groups. Um, uh, you know, we need to find ways to build. I mean, both of my kids are doing school from home because they're, you know, my daughter's college and my son's you know, the public high school over here are both closed, uh, only doing virtual learning. It's, it's hard and it's such hard work for those teachers. You know, gosh, they're working so hard to help the kids stay connected, feel like they have an identity in the classroom. Um, and, and that's going to be key. It's just really going to be key because what matters is how they're thinking and feeling, not what it looks like to us as adults. Um, and then in terms of kids with disabilities and that idea that, you know, only some people can do this. Right, I just want to show you, uh, so this, I didn't even have a chance to put captions on these brain data. Literally, these are the data that my team uh, and I met about yesterday evening. Um, longitudinal data, I sent it to Doug and he's like, what, you know? Um, but, uh, and I'll tell you what this is, but these are um, the longitudinal structural data. So in other words, and I'll show you, tell you what that means in a minute. Uh, what, these are the places in the brain where kids literally grew like their brains stronger, where there's actually more tissue, uh, regardless of how smart they were, right? Regardless of their IQ, regardless of their poverty level, regardless of their race, race and ethnicity, regardless of how well they were doing in school. So. Uh, all those things, poverty level, IQ, how well their grades are at school, uh, those things, and how well their test scores are, those all correlate with each other, but they don't, they correlate a little bit with brain development, but when you sort of control for that, when you take care of that and say like, what else is really producing brain development all over the places we care about? 
So this is the insula. If you can, can you guys see my cursor moving? Yes. Yep. So the insula, same place we're talking about this morning. This is it seen the other way and the other way. Anterior middle cingulate. These are all the regions that are involved in autonomic regulation and attention and executive control and in sort of playing out what things mean on the substrate of your guts and your visceral. Like, what am I deeply thinking about? Kids who show us in the early interview, regardless of their level, the more they show us they're inclined to be curious and try to construct their own meaning and not just give us back the answer we want, no matter how intelligent they are, they grow their brains more over the next two years in these regions, right? It's, it's like, think about it this way. You have a kid comes into your office and says, oh, Mr. Connect, you know, I'm gonna join the swimming team this fall. Or, oh, Mr. Connect, I'm gonna join the running team this fall, right? Regardless of that kid's current physical fitness level, you can make some guesses as to how their body and their strengths and their skills will change over the next couple of months, right? It's the same thing here. Regardless of the fitness level when they come to us, when they show us they're thinking and trying to make sense and engaging with that kind of meaning making and not just passively receiving information and doing what they're supposed to do, you know, but stopping with that, we can predict that their brains are going to grow more from 14 to 15 years old to 17 to 18 years old. They are literally growing their brains by thinking in these ways. So I know it's like blowing our minds, but we have to find ways to notice and encourage that in our kids. Can I just add, Mary Helen, the other thing that another brain blowing insight from your longitudinal research is that those kids who grew it the most over those few years, right, came back a few years later in the early 20s and they reported having the most, um, I don't want to get the language wrong here, but right through the surveys that you had. Yeah, the, they were the, the happiest with their lives. They like themselves. They uh, like their close relationship, their partner or whoever they're with. They um, think that their work or their school opportunities are what they always hoped for, right? All the stuff we actually want for our young people, those kids had more of. They didn't all go to Harvard, right? They didn't even all graduate college, right? Oh, no, very few. Several of them had children <laughs> between uh, when we had them at 14 and right. uh, 20. Yeah, no. Um, but it was about, we could predict that the more of this kind of meaning making they did, the better their outcomes would be. That's, that's what it was. And then just to, I know, cause we're coming up the, the type of meaning making that we're talking about, you, you know, we don't, it's not, we're just trying to sell this article or anything. It's free. So, but oh, yeah, you, you no, get, no. you get more, you get more insight if you read some of the examples in there. So, you know, just having a, for example, a systems perspective on crime is an set of examples that that's Mary right. Helen provides, you know, if, if kids can understand if they're coming from the neighborhoods, uh, in LA where you're, you know, where you get, we've pulled kids from where there's a lot of violence, right? Just having that and being able to sort of piece together, you know, concrete actions that people are making, but within a larger system. That's an example of the narrative that we're talking about where people are building both the abstract and the more concrete pieces together in a coherent okay. place. Okay. Yep. And the ones who are building the more concrete meaning, they're like, I feel bad for him or he's, you know, uh, those kinds of things, they have better relationships at the time we first read. That helps them. But then if they also think, you know, here's why that crime exists in my neighborhood. I think we should do this about it. Or there's these problems where kids want to feel like they belong, one kid says in the article or something, and their family is in it, and they want to be part of all that. So then they do it too, right? So when they have that level of understanding of the, the, the ways other people are thinking and feeling in a broader sense, and not just what they saw right here, right now, that's what we're talking about. That's what's growing them over time. 